Thanks, Gary. You're listening to Search the Scriptures Daily, a program in which we encourage everyone who desires to know God's truth to look to God's Word for all that is essential for salvation and living one's life in a way that is pleasing to Him. Thanks for joining us in this segment of our program as we conclude, or, you know, we may go a little longer, <laughs> but we're sort of moving to a conclusion of the discussions of Dave Hunt's latest book, Judgment Day, Islam, Israel, and the Nations. We're, we're getting there, Tom, but I don't think we'll make it today. Okay. Too much good stuff in these appendices. Well, that's that's what I was going to refer to. We've mm -hmm. been through mostly the book, and this is the expanded second edition, and you have added a few more appendices to it. So we want to get to that, and uh, I think it's of will be of interest to our audience that we touch upon some new new material. Mm -hmm. Originally, the first edition I think just had two appendices, and now you I have so. f uh, four or five. Well, at least so, five. So what about Dave? What about a potpourri of appendices? You, you go for that, Tom. It sounds terrific. Okay, I'd like to start with the address of. Uh, well, I was actually on the U.S. Senate floor by the senator from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. James N. Inhofe. Is that the way you pronounce his name? Yes. And it's a pretty amazing speech. He lays it out very clearly. It's an amazingly simple presentation of the rights of the Jews and the land of Israel. And, and Dave, you would think any senator who was on the floor, you know, was there in the Senate that day mm -hmm. to hear what he had to say, if they weren't asleep or distracted by other business they would have gotten, I think, a true picture of the land issues. I, what I'd like to do, unless you've got a better way of going about it, he gives seven reasons why the Israelis have the sole right to the land. Why don't we take them one by one? But or unless you want to make some comments about well, them. Well, um, I think the problem is not the Senate. The problem is the president. For really? example, the Senate has voted long ago, years ago, before President Bush even came into office, that the United States Embassy should be moved from wherever it is, I think it's in Haifa, to Jerusalem. And both Clinton and Bush have refused to do it. So I think the senators pretty much understand what the situation is. But Tom, what I'd like to do, if it doesn't, I don't think it will consume too much time, I just want to read his introductory remarks. Is that okay? Sure. He said, this is March 4th, 2002. He said, I was interested the other day when I heard that the de facto ruler, Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Abdullah, seems to be a good friend of Bush's, and they have a little barbecue there in Texas at the race and mm -hmm. some other things. And I remind us that, uh, what was it, September 11th, 2001, the president allowed the Saudis to leave. Oh, no, other planes were flying. But anyway, well, we kind of cater to them, don't we, because of the oil. I was going to say. Yeah. It must be something of interest right. for us. Yeah. Well, he says, I heard that the de facto ruler, Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Abdullah, made a statement which was received by many in this country as if it were a statement of fact, as if it were something new, a concept for peace in the Middle East that no one had ever heard of before. I was kind of shocked that it was so well received by many people who had been down this road before. I suggest to you that what Crown Prince Abdullah talked about a few days ago was not new at all. He talked about the fact that under the Abdullah plan, by the way, Abdullah means servant of Allah, mm -hmm. Arabs would normalize relations with Israel in exchange for the Jewish state surrendering the territory it received after the 1967 Six-Day War, as if that were something new. Uh, let me break in here for a minute, because the senator doesn't mention this, but it, he should have mentioned it. That means we go back to the lines of 1948. The original indefensible slim strip of land that the U.N. allotted to Israel, 13% of what they had been promised, really, mm -hmm. But the Arabs rejected it. The Arabs attacked. Six Arab armies immediately attacked Israel. In fact, in the interim, after November 29, 1947, when the UN had made that partition, Israel hadn't yet declared its independence, you've got infiltration of thousands of Arab 
commandos, you know, regular troops coming in and attacking Jewish settlements. They hadn't even declared war yet. Uh, this is terrorism to the max uh, before Israel was even born, okay? Now, Israel, I think, rightly so, says we will not honor those original boundaries because the Arabs rejected this. They rejected UN Resolution 181. They attacked us to destroy us. In fact, they said, we're going to wipe Israel off the, off the face of the earth. Well, in the book, we talk about the Six-Day War, 1967. We mention also Ruth, my wife, and I, and our four young children, ages 8 to 15 at that time. We were in Egypt when this was all going on. And there is Nasser, Gamal Abdul Nasser, the dictator, the, the Hitler of Egypt, who had just returned from Moscow, where he had been given, this is 1967 now, remember, mm -hmm. at the end of May 1967, where he had been given the Soviet Peace Prize. And when he stepped off the plane, and at the time we were in Egypt, uh, the Soviets were there. They were building uh, the Aswan Dam. I mean, these, the Soviets were the advisors and the suppliers of military equipment and strategy and so forth for Egypt. And he had just received the Soviet Peace Prize, and he stepped off the plane in Cairo. We were there. And uh, reporters rushed up and said, what will it be, President Nasser? He said, war. We'll smash him. We'll drive him into the Mediterranean. You know, we're going to wipe them out. Now, as we drove... It's another definition of peace, isn't it, Dane? It's the <laughs> southern right. Egyptian definition. Well, it's actually the definition you get in the Koran, in Surah 861. Mm -hmm. When they surrender, give them peace. Otherwise, we, we slaughter them, okay? And the only peace that Islam offers. But as we drove through the length and breadth of Egypt, and it was a little bit frightening. We had a few frightening experiences because... We were the only car with a USA on the back of it. And I think there was one other foreign car from Switzerland, I believe. That was it. And uh, I won't go into the adventures we had with the military and, and so forth. But everywhere we went, the people were talking about the 19-year war. I mentioned that in the book as well, so I won't go into great detail. But 19-year war, I have a degree in mathematics. And I didn't get it. I heard of the 30-year war, the 100-year war. What's this 19-year war? And then it finally hit me. 1948 to 1967, 19 years. They've never been at peace. In fact, it's against the rules in Islam to make peace with anyone, not just Israel, but anyone. You can have a up to a 10-year hudna, it's called, mm -hmm. That's a ceasefire, and the only purpose of the ceasefire is to gather your troops, gather your munitions, you know, and finally conquer them. But they're, everybody's talking about the 19-year war. They had been planning this war in 1967 for 19 years, ever since they were defeated in 1948. In fact, they said, we are going to wipe out the shame and the ignominy of our defeat in 1948, yeah. 600,000 uh, regular troops with tanks and planes of Arab armies are defeated by 60,000 ragtag, poorly trained, and very poorly armed I Israelis. Uh, Dave, wasn't there a war in 56 right in there? there? There was, yeah. But that was not a major war, I think. Not a, not a big one. So anyway, since 48, they have been planning to wipe Israel off the map. We took ship, you know, with our VW bus and our family uh, from Alexandria, Egypt, up to Beirut, uh, Lebanon. It was the jewel of the Mediterranean in those days, comparable to any European city. Beautiful, fabulous, modern. Of course, it was, it's was. it been destroyed by Islam, by Arafat when he took over Lebanon. I sat in a lounge in the evening and... The TV is on. I'm surrounded by, I'm the only non-Arab, we're the only non-Arabs on the ship, and surrounded by guys who are cheering, wow, thought they might have a murder, they might murder me at the moment, because there is 
Nasser parading on TV, reviewing his troops and boasting, we are going to annihilate them and, and so forth. I remember the um, at the time it was sad. It was pitiful, really, because they were no match for Israel. 1967, as you recall, the Israeli Air Force wiped out the entire Egyptian and Syrian Air Force on the ground mm -hmm. before they even got into the air. It was no match. But it was sad because we talked to some really wonderful people, Egyptians and then Nubians, the, the original Egyptians way back before the Arabs came along. And they were all so confident. I asked them, how do you think this war is going to go? Because everybody knew, you know, they're, they're going to attack Israel. Oh, the strong people will win. I remember that phrase, the strong people, the strong people. It was pitiful. It was a slaughter. I mean, it wasn't even a contest. Exactly as God said in Zechariah 12, verse 6. In those days, I will make the princes of Judah like fire, and they will devour all the nations around them. And Israel today could devour these nations. But uh, anyway, that's the Six-Day War, okay? And Israel gained a lot more territory in the Six-Day War. And uh, the Arabs want it all back. They're the ones that attacked. I I'd ask our listeners, you look up in history, find out where any nation that has been attacked by an enemy, especially that has sworn to exterminate you. Now, there's, that's unique because only the Muslims do that. Ever gave back territory? We're going to give it back to them so they can start over and fulfill their desire to slaughter us. Anyway, I'm sorry, Tom, I've taken I'm making more of a speech than, than Senator Imhoff. Yeah, but did you this. mention one thing, Dave? Inhoff says, talking about the Abdullah plan, I mean, in effect, it's just what you said. Hey, let's, let's give them another chance. Let's go back to right. 1948 and see if right. they could do it again. Right. What? See if this town they will succeed. Isn't it incredible? Yeah. I'm sorry. I will just read what he said now. <laughs> now he's talking about Abdullah. He went on to talk about other land that had been acquired and had been taken by Israel, yes, in self-defense. So I was going to be quiet <laughs> against an enemy sworn to exterminate them. Uh, he c continues, I remember so well on December 4th when we covered all of this and the fact that there isn't anything new about the prospect of giving up land that is rightfully Israel's land in order to have peace. When it gets right down to it, the land doesn't make that much difference because Yasser Arafat and others don't recognize Israel's right to any of the land. They do not recognize Israel's right to exist. I will discuss seven reasons, which I mentioned once before, why Israel is entitled to the land they have and that it should not be a part of the peace process. If this is something that Israel wants to do, it is their business to do it. But anyone who has tried to put the pressure on Israel to do this is wrong. We are going to be hit by skeptics who are going to say we will be attacked because of our support for Israel. And if we get out of the Middle East, that is us, all the problems will go away. That is just not true. If we withdraw, all of these problems will again come to our door. I have some observations to make about that, but I would like to reemphasize once again the seven reasons that Israel has the right to their land. Tom, this is a terrific speech he gave on the yeah. Senate floor. It's worth the price of the book. You know, again, Dave, as a, as a conclusion to this book, I find his statement here just gives you a synopsis that's wonderfully simple mm -hmm. and just irrefutable. Mm -hmm. So let's do this. You just read the introduction. These are not long sections. I'll take the next one. The first one that he says, the first reason that Israel has the right to their land, number one, the Jews' right to Israel, archaeological argument. That is reason number one. All the archaeological evidence supports it. Every time there is a dig in Israel, it does nothing but support the fact that Israelis have had presence there for 3,000 years. They've been there a long time. The coins, the cities, the pottery, the culture, there are other people, groups that are there, but there is no mistaking the fact that Israelis have been present in the land for 3,000 years. It predates any claims that other peoples in the regions may have. The ancient Philistines are extinct. 
Many other ancient peoples are extinct. They do not have the unbroken line to this date that the Israelis have. Even the Egyptians of today, as you mentioned, Dave, are not racial Egyptians of 2,000, 3,000 years ago. They're primarily an Arab people. The land is called Egypt, but they are not the same racial and ethnic stock as the old Egyptians of the ancient world. The first Israelis are, in fact, descended from the original Israelites. The first proof, then, is the archaeology. And, Tom, just to remind our listeners, the waqf, that is, that service, or whatever you would call it, of the so-called Palestinians, who has control of the so-called holy sites, they have been given control by Israel for many years of the Temple Mount. And they are up there excavating, trying to destroy every piece of evidence of any Israeli presence. And they claim there never was a temple there. Of course, we cite in the book earlier Mm -hmm. documents written by the Palestinians (laughs) acknowledging that this was the site of the temple. Dave, do we hear from our friend Randall Price, who's an archaeologist par excellence, has a dig over in in Israel now, that in excavating and trying to, to destroy all the evidence, they've dumped this stuff, and now archaeologists have gone to the dumps, and they have really found some interesting things that really undoes what the Muslims are trying to do. Tragedy is, Tom, that much of it has been smashed. You know, right. Bulldozers yeah. and all. But there was no Arab presence in Israel or Egypt or any of the other areas of the Middle East until the Muslim invasion in the 7th century. That was when they invaded and took over. Mm -hmm. So they talk about the great Arab nation from Morocco, you know, from the Atlantic, across through Syria and Iran, of course, the Iranians are Persians. They're not Arabs. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people are not Arabs, uh, but they speak Arabic. Why do they speak Arabic? Because they were forced to by the Muslim takeover. And the Quran is in Arabic, and you've got to know it. So anyway, it's just, Tom, it's incredible. For example, in 1948, the War of Independence, when Jordan took the West Bank, so-called, and East Jerusalem, And when Egypt took Gaza, this was Israeli territory. The first thing they did was destroy every uh, synagogue. They wiped out all the evidence they could of Israel ever having been there. And they claimed that this was their land from the beginning, which is a flat-out lie. And yet the world honors it, but uh, certainly not the U.S. Senate, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dave, reason number two, the Jews' right to Israel, historical argument. Now, this is a little long. You want to... Well, I don't think we need to read it. No. But... um, Pick out some points in it. Yeah. Well, the fact is that the Jews have been there uh, since more than 3,000 years ago, Mm -hmm. around 1500 B.C., something like that. We know that they were there, but they're not the original inhabitants of the land. They don't claim to be the original inhabitants of the land, the occupants of that land were Canaanites. And Israel was not sent in there for 400 years. God said, these people are not wicked enough for me to wipe them out. But in 400 years, they will be. In the meantime, you're going to be slaves in Egypt. You're descendants, he he told Abraham. And then you are to wipe them out because of their wickedness, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the Israelis do not claim to be the original inhabitants of the land, but the Arabs living in so-called Palestine today, calling themselves Palestinians, they claim they're descended from the original inhabitants of the land. They say they're descended from Ishmael. Ishmael's father was Abraham, right? He was not a a Palestinian. He was a Chaldean. Ishmael's mother was an Egyptian. She's not a Palestinian. There weren't any Palestinians. This is before Ishmael was born. When his mother and father arrived there who were not Palestinians, there were no Palestinians. They were Canaanites, and the Arabs today claim to be descended from the original Palestinians. It is another fraud. So anyway, he goes on. He talks about uh, his second point, the Jews' right to Israel, historical argument. This was their land. They were chased out of it, he says. And the British, he talks about the British were supposed to 
and give well, us. Well, you're going against the Turks. The British had a, right. had a sort of a, not a vengeance exactly, but they wanted to make the Turks pay, so they drove the Turks out. And they sent their troops against the Turks in the Holy Land. Now, Dave, there's an interesting story about one of the generals, uh, General Allenby, mm-hmm. and how he, according to the to history, according to this uh, senator, mm-hmm. says that he is a he was a Bible believing Christian, and he didn't want to destroy the holy places as he went into Jerusalem. So he prayed to God that maybe God would intervene somehow. And this is uh, nineteen but nineteen seventeen, right around then, mm-hmm. and they sent two biplanes over the city of Jerusalem to kind of reconnoiter and see where see what things were. Well, the the Turks had never seen a. <laughs> An airplane before, evidently. And it just, it freaked them out. They thought it was angels. Yeah. But the other thing that was interesting was they knew the name of the general, General right. Allenby. The name General Allenby means in, in Arab or in Turkish or Arabic, it means man sent from God or prophet from God. See, because Allah is in there, Allenby. Right. Allah has sent this man to take over. So they would dare, they didn't dare to fight against mm. the prophet of God. And plus there were these miraculous machines in the, right. in the sky. So if they didn't think were machines. Anyway, he walked right in and they handed it over to him. He goes on and he talks about uh, Mark Twain who visited there. And Mark Twain uh, said it was a, a desert. It was a wasteland. You don't find anybody there. Uh, it talks about Voltaire, the French philosopher, also was there and said, and because God said it would be a, a wilderness. Uh, they didn't. The Arabs didn't come in there. When they came in and took it, they didn't farm it and, and take care of this and settle it and, and so forth. It was left a wilderness. The Jews were chased out. The Jews kept coming back. And he, he explains that. And it was the Jews who built up this, who drained the swamps. Thousands of Jews died from malaria, and they made this into a fruitful land. And that was when the Arabs began moving back in to feed off of the prosperity that the Jewish settlers were making. It was their land coming back to what their ancestors had had, um, owned. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of modern Israel, Zionism. Well, Dave, he makes one other point here that I think is worth mentioning. We're, We're just about out of time. But he says that, did you know that uh, Saudi Arabia was not created until 1913, Lebanon until 1920, Iraq did not exist as a nation until 1932, Syria until 1941, the borders of Jordan were established in 1946, and Kuwait in 1961? Any of these nations that would say Israel is only a recent arrival would have to deny their own rights as recent arrivals as well. They did not exist as countries. They were all under the control of the Turks. Well, Tom, a terrific, terrific speech on the floor of the Senate. And the, we've only covered the first two reasons. We'll, we'll pick up with these next week, yeah. The Lord willing. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is TheBereanCall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back